Linda. Hello, how are you, Mel? Good, how are you? I'm excited to be here and as long as we get it going, we're going to have a great time. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're very excited to have you. I'm just going to do a quick intro of Linda and you are just going to hear so many things about her when she's talking, so I don't need to go too far into it. So Linda Olson spent 30 years as a professor of radiology at the University of California, San Diego, where she was the director of breast imaging and the recipient of many teaching awards. She was known for her compassionate care and for mentoring medical students, residents, and fellow faculty members. Linda was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2015 and is committed to empowering people living with Parkinson's and their families to live life as full as possible in spite of their disabilities and to get up, get out, and go. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Linda. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say hello to everybody and then I'm going to disappear because I'm going to use slides, which makes my talk much more interesting. So let's share a screen and share a screen one more time. I talk to myself while I do this. So <laughs> bear with me. There we go. Go hit start from slides so we get our slideshow going and we're ready. Now we're ready. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your program today. I've actually been listening all morning and I love sitting in the background. It's nice that you, you can't even see what we're doing today and learning a little bit more every time um, I come to a program. And it's interesting to me that I could listen to these speakers three years ago or four years ago and not hear what I needed to hear today because as we progress through our Parkinson's journey, we are in different places every time we come to one of these meetings and something hits us differently. And I've been listening a lot more to the medication today because it's getting time to become educated about that. So thank you for letting me, number one, listen, and number two, be here with you as a speaker today. My life as an amputee and our lives as Parkinson's patients have a lot of similar challenges. Challenges we didn't ask for and challenges we share with our family, and our friends and caregivers. Things like walking, trouble with our hands, and sometimes just looking funny. Let me introduce myself the way I heard often 41 years ago while I was an inpatient in the hospital. Linda Olson, make this go, is a 29 year old third year radiology resident who was involved in a train versus motor vehicle accident in Berschitz Garden, Germany. This resulted in traumatic amputations of both legs above the knee and a high above elbow amputation on the right side, along with fractures of the thoracic and lumbar spine. Three and a half weeks after the accident, the patient was medevaced back to the San Diego Naval Regional Medical Center. Now, since I never lost consciousness, I could remember everything that happened that day when our van stopped on the track. I could see a monstrously huge train coming toward us. I remember trying to get out of the van and rolling onto the track. Then looking into my husband Dave's eyes as he grabs me and for an instant holds me in his arms. The braking train screeches toward us and just when it can't get any louder, there is an earth shaking crash as the locomotive smashes into the van, toppling it over onto the top of me and pinning me under it as I lay on the track. Maybe I can stay alive if I hold my breath long enough. If I let it out, I'll never breathe again because the van is pressing down on me. I'm moving, sliding down the track. And then it stops. I have no feeling. In the stillness, I hear strange words. It doesn't matter what they are. If I can hear them, I'm still alive. The train backs up. I hear shouts as people grunt and strain to lift the van off of me. I'm told later that I was pushed the distance of two football fields down the track before the crumpled mass of me and the van came to a stop. It was really only 30 seconds from the beginning to the end. I look up and I can see the sun. Strangers peer down at me and they're easy to see because my glasses are still on my face. I smile as they talk to me. Uh-oh, something's not right. They're speaking gibberish. And then I remember, I'm in Germany. They must be speaking German. 
They've just pulled the van off of me and I'm alive. Waking up in the Salzburg Trauma Hospital, I know where I am. I know what happened. What I don't know is how my husband Dave is doing. I haven't seen him since the accident. I have been told that he broke his ankle and was knocked out, but will he be okay? Will he be okay with a severely disabled wife when he married a cute, slim doctor whom he hiked with, biked with, and traveled with? What if I can't do these things anymore? Why would he want to stick around? The double doors swing open and I hold my breath as Dave hobbles in with crutches, his left leg in a walking cast. I feel like I need to be strong for him, so I smile as he reaches the side of my bed, all the while silently rehearsing the two sentences I've carefully memorized. I've been thinking about things. I'll understand if you don't want to stick around. And then I wait. He lets go of the crutches and tears run down his cheeks as he squeezes my hand. I didn't marry your arms and your legs. If you can do it, I can do it. We'd been married less than two years when the accident happened. I remember saying the old fashioned vows to have and to hold for better, for worse. We thought we knew what those words meant, but what if the minister had looked into the future and said to us, do you promise to stay together if a train hits you and Linda loses her legs and an arm and breaks her back until death do you part 50 or 60 years later? It's really hard for me to understand why Dave would want to stay with me until he sat me down one day and said, Olsi, that's the nickname he calls me, put yourself in my place. What would you do if I'd been on the tracks instead of you? Hmm. I hadn't thought of it in those terms. And then he said, you need my muscles, but I need your spirit and positive energy. And so we started our journey together. My first role was to make everyone feel good, convince them we'd be okay. My cheery, hi, how are you? Rang out every time someone came into the room. Transatlantic phone calls ended with, wow, you sound normal. And my answer was, well, I'm the same person just a lot smaller. Every morning, I knew I had a choice to make. I could keep my eyes closed and moan and groan, or I could sit up, look out the window at the fortress on the hill, have someone open the sliding gas door and think about what we could do today. Something that would get us one day farther away from the accident and one day closer to the new normal. It was gonna take a long time to work through this. I was just now beginning to accept my condition, my new reality. There was no time for why or what if or blame. I knew it would take all the energy I had to move on. Dave took charge by setting up a schedule which consisted of breakfast, reading, bathing, visiting family, and lots of daily time outside when we were able to get outside. On our first trip to the garden, we'd noticed something highly unusual. They were selling beer in the hospital lobby. <laughs> All of a sudden, we had a plan. When everyone arrived the next afternoon, we loaded up our books and blankets, rolled our wheelchairs down to the lobby, bought a few bottles of beer and paraded out into the garden. Looking at this now, I can't tell if Dave is making me drink the beer or if he thinks I've already had too much. From then on, we held court every afternoon outdoors with the warm September air and smelling of cut grass and flowers. We tried to outdo each other with jokes and funny stories, becoming more ribald as the afternoon shadows grew longer. My goal was to make everyone to laugh, to see the future as positive, and to avoid tears and negativity. After everyone left at night, we forced ourselves to talk until nine o'clock in the evening. At first, it was mainly Dave. He picked things out of our life that we enjoyed. Music, work, travel, reading, and eating out. 
And if you take a look at that bike down there, that's a picture of the bike I used to ride. Uh, and as I was thinking about speaking at the Davis Finney Foundation this today, I realized this I thought was a very, very special racing bike. And I used to ride it from where I lived in Redlands and Loma Linda up to the, into the mountains above uh, Redlands up to Big Bear and stuff like that. And I loved that bike. I thought it was just a fabulous thing. But anyway, you can't do that anymore. So we crossed those things off our list. I couldn't play the pipe organ anymore. And we moved on. So Dave chose things that we could do and what needed to be done and we both decided it was useless to talk about what we couldn't do. Dave has always been a black and white sort of person. His immediate response to a problem is to create a solution. Notice that I didn't say think about or look for, I said create. He also tried to make sure it was reasonable. Thinking and planning were two things we could do in our hospital room. So within the first week, we started making lists. A notebook miraculously appeared and Dave started writing down goals for us to achieve and what he thought was a reasonable time for achieving each one. He told me later it was the only way he could think of to regain some control over what seemed like a totally out of control situation. I tried to put the components of my life on paper and then flesh them out what I thought I needed to concentrate on. And as you would guess, as most of you are, I was right-handed. So this was the first attempt for me to start writing with my left hand. So you're gonna see what looks like scribbles to me at this point. I do write a lot better now and that's 40 years later. I was already thinking about my team and how I'd relate to them. Our marriage was uppermost in my mind. Knowing that I'd have to lean on Dave but wanting to maintain our very different personalities was a really big issue for me. We knew we'd need our friends and didn't wanna push them away. At the top of my rehab list were the basic activities of daily living, my hope to drive a car again, and to use prostheses, while way off in the future were my plans to go back to work. One morning, I decided to reach out to my colleagues at work and this was about two weeks after the accident, I think. My new left-handed efforts at writing gave me my first opportunity to attempt reconnecting with my career. The first three words run up and then downhill. Dear Rad Gang, I couldn't have found a prettier town to have been incarcerated in. I choke up a little as I start. I try to make it funny, a little bit of being incarcerated and to sound positive, a prettier town. My childish handwriting continues. They have let me look at my x-rays before and after. They'll make an excellent teaching file. This is really weird. I can't spell. It's shocking to write a sentence and discover that several words have letters or whole syllables missing. I force myself to spell the words out loud and then squeeze the missing ones in haphazardly. I haven't given a thought how to spell these simple words since I was in second grade. From the beginning of my hospitalization, I wear two hats. Clearly, I'm a severely injured patient, but the doctor in me keeps peeking out from under the sheets and bandages. My eyes close as I'm transferred onto the x-ray table for a thoracic spine series. Funny. <laughs> I never knew what this felt like before. As I stare at the ceiling, I think of all the times I walked past an x-ray room and saw a patient lying on the table, skimpily covered by a thin hospital gown, waiting for a radiologist to come in and do a procedure. This table feels like a rock slab. It's really hard and it's really cold. I vow that when I return to my residency, I'll never ever let a patient lie unattended on one of these. Maybe I'll even make all my fellow residents undress and lie flat on their back and see what it feels like. I can tell that my radiology persona is coming back to life. At night when it's dark and the hospital is quiet, I imagine myself back in the reading room at the White Memorial Medical Center in Los Angeles where I was doing my residency. The 
x-ray films are all hung and ready for me to read. With only one hand, will I be able to pick up the dictaphone and speak into it and scribble the findings of the patients on the jackets at the same time while pushing on a foot pedal to roll the alternator to the next set of films? Can I do it fast enough to keep up with my colleagues? Over and over, I imagine the whole sequence in my mind. And each time I find a way to speed it up. It seems more doable every time I practice it in my mind. I open my eyes and I smile to myself. I'm really lucky to be a radiology resident and not in some other specialty that would require me to stand all day or have two hands. Our last night in the Salzburg Hospital came in late September. Five surgeons filed in and stood at the foot of our bed to bid us an emotional farewell. Three and a half weeks ago, these vastly experienced gray-haired trauma surgeons had saved my life. The one who was fluent in English spoke for them. We have something we'd like to say. We've been watching you for the last three weeks. And if you were Austrian, you might not have opened your eyes yet. You have shown us what we believe is the American spirit. Dave and I were silent, not wanting to break the spell. We knew it was time to leave the Unfall Krankenhaus and our castle on the hill and to go home and prove these men right. With Dave's love, I knew we could do it. We were medevac back to the Balboa Naval Regional Medical Center where Dave went back to his residency as a radiation oncologist in the Navy. There were very few triple amputees in the United States and the doctors who consulted on my case probably told me that I probably wouldn't be able to walk. And then I met Lieutenant Donna Pavlik, a hard driving 29 year old woman just like me who pushed me, pulled me, cajoled and provoked me. My goal was to get her to laugh every day. <laughs> Hers was to get me to concentrate. Our enthusiasm was contagious. Other patients and therapists watched and helped. A stranger looking in would have seen people laughing, sitting or lying on the floor, butt walking, doing one hand pull-ups or lopsided one hand push-ups, all of them vying to see who could have the best time. Sweat rolled down my face as I stood in my new legs, legs that looked something like they'd come from a plumbing store. Clutching the parallel bar with my left hand, I lifted one leg and put it back down. Hey, hun, remember, it takes a baby a year to learn to walk. Give it time, Dave said. Up and down the halls we walked, then out onto the hospital grounds, tethered to Donna by a rope and a belt around my waist. People see me. Some of them say hi, but most look away. In my mind, I say, hey, I'm just like you. In fact, this could be you. Four months after I first tried on my fake legs, I walked a mile. I was thrilled over the moon with happiness. Four months before, life as I knew it had seemed to be over. But was it? Are we defined by our legs? And what do you do once you get new legs? Are you the same person? Dave and I worked hard to recreate our lives. And then one day we discovered we had really recreated. We were gonna have a baby. All of a sudden, this wasn't just about me anymore. This would be changing diapers, cooking, feeding and playing with just one hand. We were gonna be a family and do all those things families do. So we had to be as normal as possible. Two months later, Dave and I are back in Los Angeles, turning into the parking lot of the White Memorial Medical Center, ready for me to go back to work. I've had 12 months to get ready. My new fiberglass and aluminum legs behave most of the time. And I think I'm ready to be on my own. I've successfully mastered the activities everyone thought necessary to live on my own again. Go to the bathroom by myself, sit up and stand up or sit down and stand up from a chair, put my legs on by myself, bathe or shower, get up off the floor if I fall, go up and down stairs and walk long distances comfortably with a cane. 
It had been hard. Sweaty, grueling, and hard work that was oftentimes discouraging, but it was done. It's hard to believe, but it's real. I'm going to be independent, living on my own again and loving it. Tiffany was born on March 12, 1981. Three years later, our son Brian was born. Our lives look pretty normal now, just about like everybody else. We'd get up early every morning. Dave would help me put my legs on. I'd get in my car, which was adapted for me to drive, take the kids to school and go on to work at UCSD, where I walked with my cane and worked nine to 10 hours before going home to fix dinner and get everybody ready for bed. While Brian and Tiffany thought everyone's mom had a wheelchair, an elevator, and walked with a cane, their friends thought it was kind of weird. When told I'd lost my arm, their friends often wanted to help me find it. After all, that's what you do when you lose something. Having kids forced us to innovate, to get out and go. First, it was the beach in San Diego at least twice a week with dinner in the sand, frisbee games, and beach toys. Growing up, I'd loved the outdoors. I'd hiked Mount Whitney and Half Dome, both of them twice, and I'd been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But because I thought I'd feel bad about all the things I couldn't do, we'd not been back out into the great outdoors since the accident. Brian was five and Tiffany was eight when my college roommate call, Carla called one day and said, hey, Linda, when are you gonna get your butt back outdoors and go camping? Are you gonna raise city slickers or real kids? So just like that, we had a new team, our camping team, a rambunctious Montana family with two kids. Yellowstone became the first chapter of our travel saga. For five days, we canoed the remote south end of Yellowstone Lake, which was accessible only by non-motorized boats. Boy, did we ever get back into the wilderness. Canoeing and kayaking became the conveyances of choice. 10 day long trips, usually over a hundred miles of lakes and rivers, places where we rarely saw anyone else. We camped in the dirt where I was queen in my kitchen without walls. I butt walked down the shore to the lake and pumped water through the filters. It might've looked funny, but it was fun and I felt like I was contributing. At the end of the first trip, we realized the need to carry me. And so Dave concocted the first of many pack frames. <laughs> my vanity got in the way. So the first editions saw me with my legs on, a totally stupid way of doing things. It didn't take long to realize that fake legs were useless out in the wilderness and we could go much farther without them. Plus it was entertaining to watch people's faces as they saw us coming toward them with the two-headed hiker on the trail. <laughs> so legs became a thing of the past and they stayed at home or in the car. Over the next 20 years, in addition to wheelchairs, I was pulled on dog sleds, snow sleds, rafted, that's a seven day trip down the Grand Canyon in the Colorado River, which I would highly, highly recommend to everybody here listening today. It's a fabulous trip. And sometimes I was even wheelbarrowed in places. This one was down in South America where it was hard to get around. We were on an island out in the middle of the Putalafu River. And this turned out to be the easiest way to move me from place to place in the camp. Not everything worked. To the left is my mermaid swimming plan that didn't really work. My prosthetist had made a set of legs for me with fins on them thinking that we could put them on when I was someplace on a lake or river and that that would propel me around and it didn't work. As did the miniaturized skier. This is up here at Squaw Valley, which is close to where I am right now. I'm in Davis today and it didn't work either, but it was worth a try. Everyone who knows us would say that our lives were normal. And so after 30 years of interpreting over half a million imaging studies at the University of California in San Diego, I agreed with Dave that it was time for us to retire. Time, to us to enjoy, time for us to enjoy our granddaughter, to travel and enjoy life. It was time to figure out new things 
and new ways like paddling a kayak. Now I'd been in a kayak for years, but I'd never really been a very effective paddler. And one afternoon we were down at Mission Bay and I was putting on a new life jacket. And for some reason, before I zipped it up, I just took the paddle and I stuck it through my, between my chest and the life jacket and snugged it up really tight and realized that this is just like having two arms. Because once it's that tight and it's so closely applied to your body, all you have to do is lean each way and you can paddle. So I could paddle and Dave could fish a little bit. He would normally sit behind me in this tandem kayak and it's kind of an exciting adventure. So the message being to myself was that even if you've been doing things for a long time, there's often something else that you can do that will make it better or easier to do. And then it happened. It's Christmas day and we are expecting 30 people for dinner. Our grown children are happily cooking, but I'm freaking out. Out of nowhere, I start yelling at them. Hurry up, we aren't gonna make it in time. What's wrong with you guys? I'm hyperventilating and shaking. What is wrong? Linda, the cool as a cucumber person has just lost it, which has never happened. It didn't even happen after we had the accident. Five weeks later, I hear the words, I think you have Parkinson's disease. Our smart medical friends all say, you can't have that. You don't have the typical signs. Wanting more certainty, I seek a second opinion, but they can't make the diagnosis either. It's then that the radiologist inside me says, go ahead, get the nuclear medicine scan so you'll know if it's true or not. As I watch the images appear on the monitor, I see the abnormality, an absence of radionuclide uptake. Oh no, it's another amputation. But this time, it's part of my brain that's missing. Dave and I start thinking about the little things that have stuck into my life over the past few years. Difficulty writing, occasional slurred speech, and restlessness in my arm and a leg, and that anxiety. So it seems like we're back to square one. We've been hit and knocked down. What are we gonna do? Well, 41 years ago, I was sweating and working out all day in physical therapy to get strong enough so I could walk. Exercise is even more important for me now. Instead of just strengthening my muscles, I now see it as a medicine which I need as importantly as I need my Cinemat. I've learned that when I start feeling anxious or internal tremors, my first thing to do is stretch, do seated jumping jacks or phantom boxing jabs at my unseen Parkinson's enemy. But as you can imagine with just an arm, it's difficult for me to get exercise enough to get sweaty and raise my heart rate. Since I'm unable to run, I use a stationary bike. <laughs> There's many days I just like to tell my legs to get going and ride on without me. It hasn't worked yet, but I'm gonna keep trying. When challenged, I can occasionally show off by doing one arm push-ups. but for every day nitty gritty exercise, I'm limited by my missing extremities. So one of my new missions in life has become finding alternative ways to exercise, to find new teams to work with just like we did when we started camping with our kids. Luckily in Southern California, as most other parts of the country, we have a lot of opportunities. I happen to work with Caroline Jordan Fitness and have encouraged her to create lots of seated or chair cardio workouts. Her enthusiasm helps me get through each video. And recently I've joined the Rogue Power PT Virtual Workouts, another program located in Southern California. I can't do all of the moves, but I can improvise enough to make it work. And I always feel better when I'm done. I'm pretty sure that your hometown Parkinson's associations have a list of local physical therapy programs that will fit your needs. If not, you can now join virtual gyms anywhere in the world. <laughs> One of the unexpected COVID blessings. These programs work our big muscle groups like the biceps, triceps, and those snazzy six pack abs. But those of us with Parkinson's disease need to pay attention to some less publicized muscles, two of them being the vocal cords 
and diaphragms. Our vocal cords are tiny, a tenth of a centimeter to a two tenths of a centimeter, but they are a huge part of our lives. It's easy to take them for granted. I know it's hard for me to remember to do my voice exercises as much as anything because I'm worried about people listening to me or hearing, hearing me when I'm not at home. We are lucky to have a whole potpourri of exercises. You should be able to find one or more that you can enjoy and participate in routinely. Now, on days when I feel like everyone can do more activities than me, I play this little video to remind myself that there is at least one thing I can do better than anything else. Watch. Hello, this is Caroline Jordan, and today I am going to try and win a butt race with Linda K. Olson. So, wish me luck. <laughs> okay, here we go, Linda. Oh, All right, we have to be lined up. Our butts yeah. lined up. Legs out. Yep. Yep. You okay, ready? Uh huh. Three. Uh -huh. Two. One. Go. Okay. No. Wait, no. Wait, no. Wait, no. I absolutely love that video. In fact, I'm really tempted to um, start challenging people to do this. Maybe we could raise money for Parkinson's. We could have butt walk raises. Uh, I'm thinking about it. I'm serious. It, it would be kind of fun. So what do we do after the words we hear, I think you have Parkinson's disease? Well, I'd suggest going back to the three things that helped me after I became a triple amputee. First, we have to accept the fact that we have this crummy disease. Then we need to learn how to adapt to the changes in our bodies and our brains. And finally, we need to innovate as we go along, figure out how to keep doing things in a different way so that we can get out and go and keep on going. Thank you. I'm going to do all the clapping because no, you can't hear it, but everybody's clapping right now. Oh, Linda, that was that was so wonderful. I thank you so much for being here. Yeah, everyone is saying words cannot express our deep appreciation to you. Thank you. I love this. I needed this today. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, everybody give all of your love to to Linda in the chat and I will be sure to send her all of the messages. Uh, yeah, they're all coming in now. Thank you so much, Linda. I honestly, it's just so moving. Um, what an inspirational story that you have and, and uh, we all can look to you whenever we have moments of thinking we can't do something we can, we can get out and go just like you're doing it. So, yeah, and we can do it together. So that's what, that's what makes a big difference. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Linda.